So let's go. The the man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only, Baldy. Baldy, Baldy. Oh, let's talk some football. Ay, 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 Baldy, Baldy. Oh, he likes meats and football. Oh, Baldy. <laughs> All right, there it is. Cuz he's ready to go. What's going on, Cuz? It's Friday, man. I, like we're getting we're getting close. We're getting close. I know the Sixers are rocking, and I know the Phillies are rolling. But it's all about football right now. Come on, are we kidding ourselves or what? <laughs> I love you. It's the truth. We are now inside a week before Detroit 2024. Yeah. The draft. You know, it's funny because, like, I was just thinking about a a buddy of mine was running the NFL Network, and he thought it would be a great idea if they took the draft to different cities. And, you know, and I just remember uh, back when it was in Philly, you know, and it just what the parkway looked like, the city. I don't think I don't think any other city that's had it, Nashville, Dallas, all the other cities have had. I don't think anything compared to what we saw in Philly that night. Where were you? Because it, it was absolutely beautiful, right? Leading, you know, you said it on the Parkway, leading to the art museum. Like the, we, we have a great museum, and it felt like a almost like a rock concert, like a, like a, yeah. like a. It was it had that music concert vibe. Yeah. Like it was like something mad, monumental, Live Aid. You know, like it felt like that. Where were you? Uh, I was uh, I was at the NFL Network. I think I was in Los Angeles. That's for that. right. So I was, you weren't in town. So I, I couldn't even attend. I was like so upset, like I couldn't attend it. Yeah. But I, there I am. There, there, there it is. It's it's like okay, we've seen these cities like show up on Friday night or Thursday night, but they don't come back on Friday, and they definitely don't come back on Saturday. Not the way they did in Philly. Like that was. You're exactly right. It was like a comp. It was like a rock concert, a state fair. A big, huge event, and I don't know. Like, I just think it's it's great. It's great for the fans. It's great for this league. We'll see what Detroit does. But I was just thinking back to Philly, cause getting ready. No, for that the was day. no. You're spot on. You know what it was too. Like, and you've seen this because of your vast travels. Like, it was almost very European. Like, yeah, in Europe, like they that's how they do things. Like, they'll go get thousands and thousands of people just to watch a soccer match in, in a communal, like in a piazza. Well, yeah, no, I mean, you just think about, you know, Hyde Park in London and mm-hmm. how that just fills up, you know, yeah. for a rock concert. Or yeah. like I remember going to Wimbledon one year and they just had more people sitting on a hill watching big screen TVs inside. They'd pay 10 pounds, go sit down. And then I think like Murray or one of the, you know, Brits were playing and like they were just all in. But I, I've seen so many concerts over in Europe, Springsteen, Billy Joel. And it's the same thing. It's like this, it's this mega event. It's bigger than a concert. And it's just the way that they sort of rally. It's their standing room only. Everybody's on the infield. Ah, that, that was the feel. Weren't you, and we're going to get to the, obviously the particulars of draft. There's a, a million things I want to get, but I love the Baldy stories. Weren't yeah. you a roadie with Bruce? Yes. Yeah. European tour. A couple, couple times. European tour. He was doing Copenhagen, Stockholm. Uh, he did, uh, we, we were in Berlin. He did like four, four shows in like eight days, including it was his birthday in Copenhagen. And I just said to his manager, Terry McGovern, like, I got to get a picture with Bruce on his birthday. So the travel dogs took a picture with him. But what happened was, these guys were getting older. I mean, this was in the 90s now, so I can imagine now. But they were getting older. They're like, Baldy, how about if you bring some fun guys and you go out and party in Stockholm and this come back like during, you know, dinner, you know, before a show and just entertain us with some of the stuff. And then we'll give you passes. You know, oh, they were in, we were in Milan at San Siro Stadium, Milan. And it was like, how about if you just entertain us with stories about places you've been, people you met and everything. You just... Like, you just got free reign. You got access. Like, you're, you're part of us. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up for that. I'll sign up for that deal. I get five of the funnest guys I know, including my brother, and we'll go we'll go party this up. That's what we did. 
That is so, A, it's baldy, right? <laughs> it, it, but that is so cool. What, what 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 was he like? Was he was he cool? Like did he? I like- remember. I, I remember. Forget this. I was with Kurt Menefee. We were in Barcelona, and um, one. This was one. This was a different tour, but this was like his acoustic tour. So we're. I'm sitting there, and we're at. Uh, you know, we're, we're at the meal, right? We're so we're. They've got a huge buffet. Everything's set up. All, you know, guys in a band and everybody there. And Bruce rolls in, and he's like, uh, and so he, you know, he's got this gravelly voice. You know, he's like. Uh, so Terry McGovern's his guy, right? He's his manager, takes care of him, body, everything, right? So it's like, uh, hey, uh, Terry, uh, I'd like uh, about uh, three three butter rolls and a ginger ale. I'll be good to go tonight. <laughs> like that was what he goes. I go three. So he you know he rocks by, goes in his dressing room, whatever. And I look at Terry and I'm like, Terry, he's gonna go rock for four hours. Gonna eat three butter rolls and a ginger ale. He goes, Baldy. Like he might he might have three more rolls. And, and another ginger ale and go another three hours. Like he's, he's, there's nothing like him. That is awesome. That Bruce Springsteen <laughs> yeah. ate three buttered rolls and a yeah. ginger ale before the show. <laughs> like that's unbelievable. Bald tales, man. That's so cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's in the new episode. He's in the new season I got a, of I got great, Enthusiasm. But I, I got a great photo. I'll never forget this. Yeah. I got a great photo. My brother, my all the guys, Monty Hunter, all the guys. And so it's his birthday in Copenhagen. So we we get this. So I tell I I say to Terry, look, we we're traveling with Bruce. We need one great picture, not like just. But so anyways, he goes, all right, Baldy, I'm gonna set it up. Like you know, he's he like he gets into this. He goes, he gets into this frame of mind before these concerts, and he's kind of like in his zone. All right, so just. Just don't like try to like strike up, you know, these conversations. We'll, we'll get the picture taken, no problem. But like, just just understand, like his mind is someplace else. I go okay. So honestly, this van pulls up, and we're at this location right outside the stage. Right, van pulls up. Bruce gets out. Literally, I don't even know if he can walk. Like he's so lethargic, right? And he and he shows up, and he's very very cordial, nice. Hey, Baldy, you know, nice to see you guys. Like, you know, like I, if I need bodyguards, I know where to go, you know. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he takes his photo and I'm, I'm looking at Terry. I'm like, is he okay? Because like, like there's nothing that you would expect from a rock, the, the biggest rock star in the world at this time, like of this sort of demeanor. And he goes, just watch. So his opening song in this tour was Redheaded Woman, right? It was, it was you know, he sang the song after his wife, right? So, um. He gets on stage, and I'm telling you, he grabbed the mic, and it was pure electricity. Like, whatever we saw at that photo where he's just sort of like, like, barely can stand up, it changed as much as anybody can change. Wow. And for four hours, like, he gave Copenhagen everything they could get. That's awesome. And it's, you know what's so interesting? That it's not unlike a game. Right, like no, you you've seen it, like you've done it, like you know before a game you're quite like, and then as soon as right, it kick off, the or kick tip off, off, the and, whistle, yes, yeah, yeah, you know, like you just you know, like look, look, Brian Dawkins was the transformer, like he yes. did his thing, but everybody yeah. has their way of kind of getting ready for a big event. You know, Michael Jordan could go play golf, and we've heard all the stories. You know, the, the day of a championship game, no problem. But there's some guys that like they got to lay in their locker room and they got to get their music on or they got to like get in their meditative state and they got to do whatever they can to get into the zone where they're not going to feel fatigue. They're not going to feel any like it's just it, it's very sports performance, athletic oriented. And, I, and I've heard the same thing. Honestly, I've heard the same thing about NASCAR and Formula One drivers. Like oh, wow. they're so relaxed. They're yeah. so relaxed in their cars. They literally, during some of these pit stops, like, they just close their eyes. Because they can't be like this, like, just gripped right. for, you know, the five White hours knuckles. or six hours or whatever. Like, they, they've got to be as finely tuned as the car. And so it's, it's, like, I've heard stories that I've seen. I've been in the pits in Indianapolis and all this stuff. Like, drivers are like that, too. That's so interesting. I... I... I I love that stuff. I love like the mental. What one day we should just discuss kind of the the mental piece of it. Like when you go into it. Uh, but I got a bunch of things before we get to draft stuff and uh, baldy sleepers and meat locker stuff. The 
there was a great story. I don't know, Jeremy Fowler about Belichick. And uh, I'm fascinated by Belichick. And interesting, he said the Giants, the Cowboys, and the Eagles were teams that he would look to next year. Now, what kind of pressure does that put on Nick, on a Sirianni, that, like, listen, if things go uh, sideways again, you know, that's it. Like, you got uh, Belichick sitting there telling you that he would come to Philadelphia. And what kind of fit would that be here? Well, I think, first of all, I think there's a very real connection to New England, to Belichick. You know, even when Chip Kelly came, you know, the Eagles went up to Foxborough and they trained with them and preseason games. And, you know, there's Laurie and Crafts and, you know, know, like there's a connection. Okay. Um, I think, you know, coaches, Coach Belichick has looked at organizations from the top down. Okay. Like draft process, um, you know, finances, the whole thing. And he's identified these places. Now, is there pressure on Nick if you win and you take care of business? There's never any pressure. Um, but if the thing goes sideways like it did last year, like then it's, I think that could be very real. I think it, I think it'd be a great fit. I think you walk into any locker room and there's instant respect. Now, there's been some hit pieces. And I'm not saying Jeremy Fowler and what he did with Atlanta and mm-hmm. Arthur Blank down there and, you know, and Robert Kraft saying this and that. Like, I, I don't know any of that. It's just, But I've seen some hit pieces on Belichick. Um, that look, I rem- like, I, like, I can't really speak to that. Like, all I know is success is success and rarefied success is rare. But, you know, I remember when Mike Holmgren left Green Bay, everybody said, good riddance. What a bear. What a son of a bitch. All this stuff. And they never want anything after that. You know, he left and went to Cleveland, went to Seattle, wherever. Like, sometimes you just need that iron fist. This is the way it's going to be. This is locker room. This is what... This is what we need to pull all the oars in the same direction. So, I, you know, you know, I'm including the owners. These owners get they, they get the wrath too. You know, it's not uh, it's not like the coach is the coach, and he is he demanding. Yeah, you know, is is it hard to work for him? Oh yeah, it's hard. But you want success at the highest level. There's a price to pay. Yeah, it, it, it's I, it's so interesting. I mean, you know. The Cowboys make sense. Oh, there you go. We saw your your big finger on the <laughs> camera. <laughs> Classic. Yeah, well, it was a meat locker moment. They they they, they definitely get in the way sometimes, Cubs. <laughs> so, um, but real quick, we thought Dallas. You and I thought Dallas was going to be a a fit for Belichick right, right after this season. I thought so. I thought there was consideration, especially the way the Cowboys season ended. I mean, it ended in just, you know, another one of these playoff losses where, you know, Green Bay ran them right out of their own gym, and it was just hard to watch. Yeah. And so, look, Jerry Jones made a decision to stay the course. We'll find out if it's the right decision with Mike McCarthy. But, I mean, if Bill Belichick is waiting there, you got to at least have the conversation. I don't care. Like, and look, I think he's – I think there's 10 guys right now that if you really, really wanted to win, you'd make the change right now and you'd put Belichick in. Like you just – like the the day to, the week-to-week game planning, the subtle things that he did is what coaching is. Like right. did he ever have – did he always have the best roster? And he had the best quarterback. Okay. Did he always have the best roster? Not even close. But they still won. You know, you're down 28-3 to Atlanta. All right. And there's Matt Ryan, the MVP of the league, and Julio Jones and – Here's his comeback. Like, this stuff is real. Yeah. How, how he manipulated that game at the end when Seattle got the ball and they're driving down to the one-yard line, and he's already anticipated the play based on a formation at a goal-line defense that he never ran all year. And he called the goal-line defense in the moment, and he comes up with the interception. Yeah. Like, that stuff is real. Like, that is real. That's coaching. Mm-hmm. Now, you're, you're spot on. Do you uh, – do, what, what kind of – does Sirianni feel heat or does – it's like, listen, it does, Belichick doesn't matter. If, I, if it goes sideways, I'm out anyway. Right. No, I don't know. If, I, you know, I, I think he, he hears everything, like every coach does, you know, whether it's listening to you right now or you read the papers or whatever. I mean, he's, right. he, they hear it all. But I don't think it puts any more pressure. I mean, the, the owner was pretty generous going, okay, 
Let's get rid of the uh, the coordinators. Let's change. Let's bring Kellen Moore in. Brian Johnson wasn't ready. Look, Vic was here. We thought we had Vic last year. We took yeah. a disciple of his. It didn't work. Like, let's go, like, free agency. Like, I don't know how much better you can do in free agency. We'll see if they can bring all the pieces together. But, I mean, I, th- I don't know that any head coach could get more from Howie and the owner than what he got in the last – since because I feel like some of the stuff – they did this off season was to take some of the stink away from the finish of that season. Cause it was ugly and it was bad. And you know, it, it was really, it's still confusing. It's just still confusing how a roster that looks so good for the first three months could be so bad the last six weeks. Anyways, I don't think Nick can look at this thing and go, I can't get any more support than what I've got. And if Belichick's on the outside and you know, he's got a, a plane ticket to Philadelphia if things don't, I can't ask for anything more from my organization. Yeah, I, I, I'm completely with you. Uh, all right, draft. Some uh, of the notable mocks just came out. Brandon Donahue from Sharp Football has the Eagles taken back, uh, trading back to 28 to take Nate Wiggins, who we know we talked about the other day. He's got a lot of speed. He's uh, he's a man corner out of Clemson. Peter Schrager from NFL Network. Uh, Cooper DeGene, Iowa. Mm-hmm. Do you like any of those? Yeah, I love Cooper DeGene. I love him. I mean, I think that he's a first-round talent. Uh, people were waiting on his medical and his workout uh, once he, he got healed up from the season. Uh, there's a lot of great versatility that you can do with him, but you can also line him up and put him on, you know, a receiver and let him go, you know, press him, uh, whatever Vic wants to do. You know, he wants to run his cover six, whatever, whatever they're into, I think he can play it. I think look, a quarter makes a lot of sense because I, I know people will point out that Lito Shepard was the last corner they drafted, but they also haven't had a defense that is bad as what we saw last year. Either. Yes. You know, sometimes um, the circumstances dictate what you do. Like they've got to get better at corner. Now maybe Keely Ringo in the second year becomes a better player, but I don't know. You've got a couple of 30 plus year old corners. Um, one of them didn't look very good uh, last year or the year before. Uh, he's still on the roster, but they've got to upgrade that position. You can't let the ball keep going over their head like it did last year. You know what is interesting? I was talking to Kevin DeGandhi, who'll be hosting uh, the draft ESPN, and we were talking about uh, the core of the quarterbacks and how this, especially the first round, he said Minnesota, Denver, and the Raiders – will have a huge play on the how the early part of that draft goes with the trade possibility. That the, the Chargers, even New England, are all saying, like, hey, if you want to come up and you want to pay a price, we'll trade, we'll trade out. Well, I hear the same thing. And, look, New England could trade out for sure. They have a, a very depleted roster. But I also believe if the quarterback is there that they love and they know that they feel like he is the future, then they're going to take him. They're not going to trade because they don't want to be picking number three again for, in, for a quarterback. Like if they get a chance to get him now, they're going to take him now. That's what I believe. But for sure, I mean, look, the Giants are definitely in play for a quarterback. There's no question Minnesota made the trade with Houston six weeks ago to get the 23rd pick to have the ammunition to go up. Like, they're dead set in moving up and going to get it. The Raiders could easily do it um, if it's for the right guy. Because they're like, not all these guys are going to be the right guy. I feel like if Minnesota trades up, the roster that they have, especially at the receiver position, yeah. and now that they picked up Aaron Jones as well, and with Kevin O'Connell, like, that's a good situation for any of these quarterbacks. You got Sam Darnold for whatever Sam is. There's no pressure to have to play him right away. But if he beats Sam out, he beats Sam out. And I feel like Minnesota is probably in the best position to trade up. Denver doesn't have a lot of assets, cuz, unless they start mortgaging next year. And then I think they would only do it if it's for a guy, one guy, um, you know, that might slip or slide or they feel like he can do it. And I feel like the Raiders are in a similar situation. So I feel like. Minnesota is definitely like on the move and look, Arizona would love to, you know, be, be that team that could trade down. They could still get a receiver. And I, I'm sure that the board 
Monty Austin for the general manager. I'm sure the board has neighbors, Harrison, Odunze, like most of us, pretty close. If you can get one of those and get extra picks on a, on a team that needs defense and needs a lot of players, it makes a lot of sense. I, speaking of the receivers, uh, there was something interesting, and I, I'm curious your take on it. Uh, Thomas, who I, I love, I think Tom, he's a terrific receiver. Uh, yep. Neighbors gets all the love, but Thomas is really good. If Thomas is there for the Eagles, do you do it? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't like if you're saying, well, we're not going to be able to keep AJ Brown and we better start building for the future. It would be an Eagle move, but you're not going to get with Devontae and AJ out there right now. There's already a problem with some of these guys not getting enough targets. Yeah. If you're trying to work in a, a rookie number one draft pick, I don't think the room is going to be real comfortable. I think you have to consider that. I also, you know, have to consider, is there a corner in the second round that can line up and play press man coverage next year? Yeah. Um, and after you take, you know, with that, with either 50 or 53, you know, those picks in the second round, like, you know, maybe they feel like there is somebody like that. And if that's the case, then maybe they do something like that. Uh, I think there's a particular lineman that they're really in love with, but they don't think there's any chance that they can get him. Yep. Um, sick, sitting at 22. So, like, I think just knowing guys that have worked with Howie, as we speak right now on this Friday morning, six days before the start of the draft, they're going through every possible scenario to the point where they wear guys out. But they also will be well, well prepared if anything should happen, any scenario. Who knows if Drake May drops and somebody wants to trade uh, you know, any any scenario. Right, right. Like I think they want to not just not just be prepared for themselves, but everything else around them that might affect them. Now it, it's it was interesting. Somebody brought it up to me uh, about Thomas, and I guess all the AJ and you know AJ on social media. You never know what's going on in the whole that whole night. But like so good, and and he put that in my ear. I'm like, wow. Because I didn't even think about it. Like you, I just go, you, you got to go corner or O-lineman. Like, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I just kind of think it's one or the other. Uh, but when they put that in there, I was just curious to see kind of your take. Have you uh, gone in, is there any, like, sleeper-type guys, like mid-round guys that have caught your eye? Because you have a great discerning eye. Uh, I remember you talking about Aaron Jones. You liked Aaron Jones um, uh, in that draft, and not a lot of people talked about him. You were the one that lo- that liked him. He turned out to be a terrific player. They had this kid from Colorado State, Muhammad Kamara, and honestly, when I watch him, I kind of think I'm looking at a very young Brandon Graham. Hmm. He's he's under six two. He's two hundred fifty five pounds, but he's got he's a football player. The way his movement, he makes plays. He makes a lot of plays behind the line of scrimmage. He's a very good pass rusher, but he's just a good football player. Like I kind of, and he can, he rushes inside the way. Look, the biggest play in Philadelphia Eagle history is Brandon Graham beating the right guard to get to Tom Brady and getting the ball out of his hands in Super Bowl 52. Like I see those kind of things with him matchup wise. Like that's the guy, but Daydream Taylor Demerson from Texas Tech. I keep coming back to him. Everybody's Mm. looking for safeties. Yeah. People don't want to draft safeties in the first round. They want to go to free agency and find guys that can really play. Like Seattle blew out both starting safeties last year. They brought other guys in. Like you almost have to find your safeties in free agency. Cam Curl goes to the Rams from Washington. But, you know, he was a seventh-round pick, cuz, out of Arkansas. Like he made an immediate impact in Washington. The Rams love him. He's going to start for the Rams next year. Seventh-round pick out of Arkansas. Like this Dadrian Taylor Demerson, he had eight interceptions the last two years. But when you watch him run, it kind of reminds me, honestly, like I don't want to compare him to Talanoa Hafanga. Oh, you know, yeah. But he was a fifth-round pick out of USC. Yeah. And um, great tackler, great playmaker, been to the Pro Bowl, got hurt last year. But, been to the, like, I watch this kid play, and I'm like, I know he can play. You know, it's a question of where, where are you comfortable taking? Fifth round? You know, I, I feel like – that's kind of where he's going to go. Yeah, it's – I can't wait, man. It's it's coming. So, what do you, what's Baldy got on tap for the weekend? It's – you're in Florida, I see. And uh, what are you – I'm coming back hit? home on – I'm coming back home Sunday. 
I really want to get locked in. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen between now and Thursday night. I'm going to be at the Jets on Thursday night, breaking down their first pick. Whoever, if it's a Doomsday, if it's Brock Bowers, if right. it's Olu Fashanu, like I'm there, they're going to be live, and I'm doing a breakdown on their first pick. Coming, you know, I'll, I'll stay up there with the Jets draft, and then Friday I'm heading out to L.A. I'm uh, analyzing, you know, Friday's picks, Saturday's picks uh, for the next three days out there. So I, I just want to get comfortable with some of these guys in, in later rounds that we're going to see because Saturday goes fast, right? Yeah. You're, like, it, it just fly, – these names fly off the board. You don't even have enough time to really analyze it. But every team wants to know, like, are we finding a steal? Like, for example – there's this kid I was watching the other day from UTEP, okay? Um, a UTEP minor, Elijah Klein, a four-year starter, right? Like, incredibly strong kid, but he's got good movement and he's got power. So I, I cross-checked him with a, what one of the offensive line coaches I really okay. like in this league. And I just is, is ran he a team by him. He's a guard. He's played every position though. He's played both tackles and he's played both guard huh. positions. So he's very uh, versatile, but I think I feel like he's a right or a left guard. But I feel like the fifth round is a sweet spot for him. And you just think about it, like that's that's where you can get starting guards. Yeah, Elijah yeah. Klein. You could find a starting guard. I, love I believe it. he could start in this business. The Baldy Sleepers. I'll be over Monday. All right. And I'll then, be there all day, cuz I'll be yeah. over there all day. I'll be over yeah. Monday. Well, and then we'll hang out. Maybe. Uh, Go back and get some. Uh, I'll bring some steaks for you. Yeah, well, 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 we could do that. We could do the steaks on Monday, but we yeah. can we can sit there and grind yeah. for a bunch of hours. Look at some of these kids. Yeah, I, I would love that. Anything fun. that's coming across your any like I love when people throw names across my radar. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Like, well, I got a bunch of names that we'll sit down and we'll do it this way, and we'll, and we'll bring it up for on the show next week because I got yeah, a bunch of notes sure. that I, I got from people. That I want to run right. by you. So we'll do it. Yeah, let's do it. My guys. brother, have a great weekend. Safe trip home. We love yep. you. Baldy. We all silly like the mayor. 